Proverbs chapter 14 tonight. We'll be picking it up here in verse 22. Proverbs 14, verse 22. Last week we talked a lot about, uh, you know, what pure or true religion is as we took from the book of James chapter 1, verse 27. Pure and undefiled religion is really an outworking of what is taking place inwardly. That the output and the outwork is <clears throat> really the testimony of what's in one's heart. And so the proverb here in these couple of verses states that a poor man is hated even by his own neighbor, meaning that, you know, the poor people are just those of, you know, uh, less fortunate, um, are disregarded by those around them. And remember that this is the heart and the ministry, really, of Jesus' ministry. Um, one of the things that Jesus highlighted throughout the Gospels is that this is who he came for, those who were of great need, not only the poor in material things, but ultimately the poor in spiritual things. The purpose of the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the poor in spirit, and that's the spiritual aspect. Jesus also said to the one, you know, that gives water to one who is thirsty, one who visits him in prison, as he went on this list of things, then they said, Lord, when were you ever in prison? When were you ever hungry? When? And they go on, and Jesus says, when you've done this to the least of these, you've done this unto me. Um, this is the heart of the ministry of Christ to reconcile, to restore, and to give hope and then it also says, he who despises his neighbor sins, but he who has mercy on the poor is happy. I'm often reminded of John, the apostle in, in 1 John, where he says that God is love. And those who don't love don't know God. But he also kind of proposes this thought, and he's kind of saying, listen, you can't say that you love God and hate your brother how can you um, you know love the one whom you have not seen and and you're hating the one who's there in front of you it just doesn't work and so this whole idea really in these proverbs are principles that make their way through the new testament these are principles that define the outworking and i want to propose tonight the fruit of the life of the christian what does this look like so he continues on here, and remember that it's there in James where James says, you know, you say you have faith, then show me your works, right? Because faith without works is dead, he says. But really what he's implying is that our faith should work. There should be an outworking. There should be the ability to be able to see the life of faith in the Christian working it out so to speak. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean we are always going to bear the right fruit, but that is something that should be consistent in the Christian's life. So, verse 22 says, Do they not go astray who devise evil, but mercy and truth belong to those who devise good? Now, the question is, do they not go astray? The answer is, absolutely. Absolutely. Those who devise, or some translations say plot evil, those who have a desire to practice such things, ultimately, they, they err. And they fall away from the path of upright living. They have no desire to pursue the things that are upright. And so there is a straying away, a deviating and so their walk is different. Their way is different. Their kind of the contrast is given by Paul's letter to the Galatians. In Galatians chapter 5 and verse 21, Paul says that, you know, this picture of the flesh, he kind of gives this description of this is what the work of the flesh is. This is what it looks like. In other words, this is the identifier if someone is walking in the flesh. In verse 20, he goes on to say, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, 
contentions, jealousy, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness, revelries, and the likes of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. In verses 16 through 26 of Galatians 5, this is really the, the walk of the Christian. It is that the believer is to be led by the Spirit, and this is what he says in verse 16, walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And he talks about this, this battle, this, this struggle in verse 17. But then he also reminds us that we can be led by the Spirit. We can, to a degree, put the works of flesh to rest by allowing the Spirit, being led by the Spirit, to be the thing that evidences our lives. So he goes on to say here that if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now the work of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, and then idolatry and so on and so forth. But then he kind of says, now on the other side, what does it look like? to walk in the Spirit. Well, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness and goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And so this is the fruit that James speaks about. This is the fruit that Jesus says in John 15, 16, when he says, you didn't choose me, I chose you, and I appointed you that you will go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. Anytime we see the picture of the scripture speaking concerning fruit and how the life of the believer is to be, this is the fruit that we're to be producing. Now, we're not always going to produce fruit at the optimum level. But this is where we experience the grace and the mercy of God. Now, he says, do they not go astray who devise evil? Absolutely. We've just seen the way they go. Paul just gave you a list of things and a clear picture of those who devise evil because that's what they desire to be led by. But you can devise good. He says, but mercy and truth belong. Notice this, that it belongs to those who devise good. Now, in other words, you can actually look at this and say, in the context of what he's stating here, is that this grace and truth, in other words, the Bible says all the paths of the Lord, like mercy and truth, listen to this, they are that very thing. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth. Psalm chapter 25 and verse 10. The way of the Lord is mercy and truth. Now, when you look at this whole picture and you say, what is the beauty of mercy and truth? The Hebrew word here is chesed, for mercy. Um, it's also the word used for, uh, you know, the grace of God. It, it has the picture behind it of the heart of mercy and grace and the way God responds to his people. Now look at this. So I, I like what Psalm 85 in verse 10 says. Psalm 85 in verse 10 couples mercy and truth this way. It says, mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed. Truth shall spring out of the earth and righteousness shall look down from heaven. Yes, the Lord will give what is good and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him and shall make his footsteps our pathway. So listen to this. When did grace and truth, or chesed, mercy and truth, meet together? Some would propose that perhaps this is a reference because the context of the passage is speaking about the Lord's restoration of the land. Ultimately, God is the restorer of his people, right? But when will they experience this restoration? In what manner, in which way would God provide it? And 
the thought to propose here would be John chapter 1, verse 14. The Bible says, And the Word became flesh, and we beheld His glory, full of grace and truth. We beheld the glory of the Father. It was full of grace and truth. It was full of mercy and truth. It was full of chesed and truth. And when the two met together, righteousness and peace have kissed. Remember that they say, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. The only time there'll be peace in Jerusalem when the Prince of Peace comes to Jerusalem. So it's just an amazing picture here that this is actually the path or the footsteps. And this is what he's saying as he closes out in verse 13. Righteousness will go before him. So may we follow this and shall make his footsteps our pathway. So in a sense, it's a privilege to walk in his path he set for us. It's a privilege to walk in this path that he has set for us. So the person who devises evil has no desire to walk the path that is set by the Lord. But those mercy and truth belong to those who devise good. Because the path of the Lord is good. In all labor there is profit, but idle chatter leads only to poverty. Idle chatter means only talk. But there are other things that lead to poverty, like stinginess. In chapter 11 and verse 24. Stinginess does. Um, ultimately, you'll find within a stinginess uh, a greed and covetousness because you're stingy. You, you're holding on to what little you have and you kind of put everything, your hope, into that little bit. And covetousness and greed spring forth from this. The Bible also says in Proverbs 21 and verse 5 that, that, that haste, you know, leads to poverty. In other words, the Lord wants us to be stewards of what he entrusts us with, but, but not to deal with these things hastily, that we have to be very careful. Also, hedonism. It's always that picture, right, when a person receives an inheritance. You know, the inheritance that they would receive as far as perhaps given, and then they just kind of go and just blow it on everything. I mean, that's really the picture there with that. It's like, man, life really, you know, just chewed you up and spit you out. Also, oppression. And allowing oneself to fall under that and live under that will ultimately lead to poverty and favoritism. Proverbs twenty two sixteen speak of those two, oppression and favoritism lead to poverty and ultimately, the whole point is that it's not to say that if a person is living in poverty, that this is exactly what they are. It says these things will lead to that. And typically, in that context, it's a person who's afraid that looks at poverty as, you know, that's a terrible thing. But the Bible speaks of those who are poor, that they are looked upon by the Lord and cared after by God and by God's people. So Jesus even goes on to say in a whole series of teaching, don't worry, don't worry about those things. But how many of you guys know poverty is one thing many people worry about? And rather the Lord says, what you can do rather than worry about this is trust in me. Verse 24 says, the crown of the wise is their riches, but the foolishness of fools is is folly. So in other words, you know, the wise person, really he's saying, is a person who's blessed. You know, th this whole reminder of wisdom in the Proverbs is, is key. It, it really is. It's key. That if we use wisdom in what we do, if we're not, you know, living carelessly, but, but clearly looking at the Lord's word and, and seeking his face in the context of what we find here, there, there is wisdom. A matter of fact, there are things that come along with it. So the Bible says that wisdom begins somewhere. It has a starting point. Where is that? It says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning. 
of wisdom. The fear of the Lord. Now, think about this here. So the wise person is truly blessed. Their riches are in their wisdom. But the foolishness of fools is folly. In other words, there's no blessing, but rather folly. That's it. That's all that comes in that. A true witness delivers souls. Now, I don't want to stretch this verse too far, but, but ultimately the context of the verse is saying that, you know, telling the truth when giving testimony, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God, is really what's in view here. That's the context of it. But we also can say, in a sense, to take this word witness and do a play on words in the context of the New Testament, a true witness of Jesus Christ delivers souls. As the proverb says, he who wins souls is wise. And if we are a witness to the truth and giving the whole truth and nothing but the truth, God will help. And so just a thought and an idea to put there. But ultimately, the proverb is saying a true witness, someone who, who tells the truth will save a life. But a deceitful witness speaks lies. So in a sense, he's kind of giving this contrast and he's saying you could either save a life or you could disregard life. And the reality is truth always wins. Ultimately, the truth comes out. But living in a day and age where truth just seems so far away and you don't know who to believe, I, I don't know, it could just be me. I'm not talking about you guys. I'm just talking about everything we hear and see the moment we turn on anything that bears any news of what's going on, right? And so where's the truth in everything? We don't know. But here's what we do know. I might not know the truth in what's taking place here and there because so many things have been debated, discussed, argued, fought over everything, right? But there's one truth that I do know. It's the truth of God's word. And this is why I took this and said, you know, maybe not to stretch the passage out, but to be a true witness of the truth in a day where there is no truth then we will be true witnesses that will deliver souls in this time. Because it's the truth of God's word that truly delivers a man's soul. Amen? And then in verse 26, it says, in the fear of the Lord, there is, now listen to this, remember how we talked about, uh, you know, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of, of wisdom. It's beginning of knowledge, beginning of these things. The Bible says in verse 7, of Proverbs chapter 1, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. So think about this. This whole picture, we have an understanding, we have wisdom, we receive from the Lord when we walk in the fear of the Lord. And look at what it says here. Here's a couple of things, and jot these down as we work our way through this. Number one, in the fear of the Lord there is strong confidence. When one walks in the fear of the Lord, there's strong confidence. And what does it mean to walk in the fear of the Lord? In one aspect, it's obedience to God's word, but it's also trusting God. The fear of the Lord is putting your insecurities at rest and surrendering them to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. The fear of the Lord is taking every notion and every thought and everything that you've once believed that perhaps has had you twisted up, confused, discouraged, and just messed up. And abandoning those things to the fear of the Lord, to his word. So confidence comes in our lives. And some people say, I just want to be more confident. Well, if we trust the Lord, if we obey his word, there is, the Bible says here, strong confidence, not just confidence, but strong confidence. In a sense, there's a boldness. And all of us like boldness. Some people want to be more bold in their witness. Others want to be more confident in what they're doing. Now, listen, I know that, you know, we want to be better employees at our work. What do we do it for? 
Colossians chapter 3 says, listen, we don't do this for eye service. We do it under the Lord. It's so that God gets the glory. And, and even in those things, you can actually take the same practice and, 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 and be confidently encouraged in what you're doing, that, that you're honoring the Lord. It's not just confidence in your faith. It's not just confidence in your walk. It's in your confidence Confidence in your output and what you're doing, like knowing that you're honoring the Lord in what you do. So strong confidence comes from the fear of the Lord. And the most important thing of strong confidence is confidence in God's word and trusting the Lord. Because some people say they love God, but they, they say that more in word rather than action. And what I mean by this is trusting the Lord. So the fear of the Lord, there is strong confidence. The Bible says, and his children will have a place of refuge. I like this here because in the fear of the Lord, let's consider the, what it's saying here is not only will the Lord's children have a place of refuge, but let's consider our children. When we teach our children the fear of the Lord, they also will have a safe refuge. When we instruct them in the things of the Lord, those who are influenced by their godly parents. In the same way, the fear of the Lord gives us refuge in the Lord, kind of what we were speaking about this morning. This is the hope that we have. There are benefits that come, not only knowledge and wisdom, but, but strong confidence and refuge. Verse 27 says, the fear of the Lord is a, a fountain of life. Think about this. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. And in verse 22 of Proverbs 16, it says, Understanding is a wellspring of life to him who has it, but the correction of fools is folly. It's useless. So if one walks in the fear of the Lord, listen to this. A person can prolong their days, so to speak. They could live well. They can keep themselves from destruction and it's important to walk in the fear of the lord especially that but also it means that how we live our lives you know your life your life lived out could either be listen to this guys your life lived out could either be life draining or life giving think about that for a moment it can you're your life lived out could be one or the other. Ultimately, that's what our lives are. They're either draining life from people or giving life to people. And, you know, you can change the whole mood by your attitude in a setting or a situation. But, you know, it, 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 serves, it serves good. It, it serves good. I remember... One time, this was, man, I don't know, we, we weren't even here. We were still in the city of Ontario when we, when we had the, you know, the church. It really wasn't a church. It was just a Bible study group. But, you know, there was this person that was just always happy. Now, don't get me wrong. I like happy people. But, you know, they were just always happy. And so I would kind of sit back and I would observe them and I would say, they can't always be happy. Like, something's up here. Either they're high or they're coming to church high or something. <laughs> I mean, our ministry was like we were ministering to down and out people. I mean, they were just down and out. But this one was always high. And the only people that were high were the ones that would come to church or happy were the ones that would come to church drunk and they liked the music. And we were uh, using another church and they worshiped a little different, not not bad or not good. I'm not really knocking it, but they used the whole tambourine thing. Everybody would. So they'd get the tambourines and they would really get happy with those things and we had to start hiding them and stuff, you know, after a while, but <laughs> they'd get a little bit too happy with those things. But anyways, um, we, we, were, we were out at a park, and the happy person was with us. And, you know, this was not a good park. And so we're setting up to give out, you know, food and everything. I'm looking around, you know, I'm like, okay, we got it. That day I had, you know, um, ladies with me and a couple of kids. And the happy person 
you know, I mean, he's a happy guy. I mean, what is he going to do if something happens? So I'm like, he ain't going to help at all. You know, and in my mind, I'm like, I'm going to have to take care of him and them and everybody. And sure enough, something happened. It was just a matter of time. And I said, this isn't good. So I says, I'm looking around and saying, okay, Lord, you know, I'm praying. I'm like, God, you just, you know, we're here. We're serving you, Lord, you know, but we have to be vigilant, wise as a serpent, gentle as a dove kind of thing, right? So I'm like, okay, Lord, you know, <laughs> if it goes down, it's going down for Jesus, right? <laughs> All my prison instincts are coming out, you know, eyes in the back of my head and everything. And, <laughs> and I look, and then there's the happy guy, all happy, smiling at everybody. I'm like, this, wow. You know, and then the Lord just gave me this sense of like, this is weird. It was weird. The Lord just gave me the sense of like, your help is standing next to you. It's the happy guy. <laughs> and I turn and I look, and he's looking right at me like. <laughs> so I go up to the situation and I go to diffuse the situation. The guy that was, you know, he was under the influence really bad. He was, you know, speaking very derogatory toward the women. And I had to step in and have, I'm just not going to sit there and let something like that. And so, uh, you know, I could tell the guy looking at me, walking toward him. I mean, literally sizing me up. I'm like, oh, this is not good, man. And I turned back just to glance, just to make sure everything was fine. And guess who was right by me? The happy guy. <laughs> All I said to myself was, I hope he fights good. Seriously, I thought like, man, that smile ain't going to help right now. That's exactly what I said. And the moment we walked up, I says, I says, hey, uh, I says, check this out. Can I talk to you real quick? And the guy was like, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. You know how they do it. Try to act all tough. Like, calm down, hardcore, man. You, you relax. And I just says, hey, look, uh, I, I, I could bring you something. I heard what you said over there. You know, it's kind of out of line. You know, these, these women are here to serve you guys. They do this on their own time, you know, and I just ask that, you know, maybe you keep you know, those, those things that you're saying to yourself, you know? And the guy looked at me, and right before he was going to say something, the happy guy interjects. And I don't know what the guy was going to say. Only God knows, and I never asked, because the happy guy just says, hey, you know what? We're here because we love you. We love Jesus. We love everybody we love the food, we love the sisters, we love the kids. Look around you. The guy's like, you know, looks around. You, know, like, you see all these people here? It's like, yeah, he's like, we love them too. And what Brother David is trying to say to you is that he loves you. He's just trying to be careful and take care of the people. And he was smiling the whole time. And I was like, oh, man, he's going to get beat up. <laughs> so I was like, so I was like thinking already, okay, Lord, I'll let this guy waste all his energy on him. And then when he's tired, bam, I'll get him. No, <laughs> you know how we do it. <laughs> and anyways, the guy stopped for a moment. He looked and the first thing he did was he looked at me and he stared me up and down. He said, brother David. I said, yeah, he says, I'm sorry. And he looked at the smiling, happy guy and he smiled at him. And he went like this to both of us. He goes, bring it in. <laughs> so I was like. <laughs> and so anyways, you know what he says? He says this. He says, Brother David, if you feel comfortable bringing me food over here because, you know, you don't or they don't feel comfortable, I'll wait here. So I did. I went and took in the food. He kept apologizing, very apologetic and everything. And he... Um, you know, he just says, he goes, I, I, I thought you were going to tell me to get out of here. I couldn't be in the line. You weren't going to serve me. And I says, literally, I wasn't. I just didn't want you to do that. I was going to offer to come and bring it over here to you. Then he says, but that guy's smile. It just, and you know, the crazy thing, the dude didn't even have a nice smile. I mean, it's like, <laughs> I was just tripping out. I'm like, are you serious? <laughs> and this is what he said. You know what he said? He said, I've been out here for years. This is what he told me. I've been out here for years, and nobody's ever taken the time to smile at me. And then it hit me as I'm walking back. I felt this big. 
And the Lord says, I told you the smiling guy was going to help you. And I went up to this guy and I just says, hey, man. I says, um, man, thank you for that. Thank you for that. He was like, oh, he's, I thought he was going to get us. <laughs> so I just says, really? He goes, man, I was scared. He says, Dave, I was scared. He goes, I thought I was going to have to hit the guy. That's what he said. I go smiling and everything. He goes, oh, I was going to get him. He's all, but the Lord just told me, just talk to him. And I listen and I'm just like, Ooh, okay, good. Because I was thinking the same thing, man. But thank God that he brought you because, and, and this is what I told him. I says, you know, whatever it is that makes you smile every day, keep doing it. Because in that situation, all of the, whatever I would have said wouldn't have helped. The Lord brought you and your smile and he, you know, he brought you and that smile to help in this situation. And you know what he told me? He says, you know what makes me smile every day? And I said, what is it, bro? He says that I'm not the man I used to be. I thought that was pretty powerful. So this little, you know, smile. The Lord used it to diffuse a situation that probably could have been horrible. It could have even perhaps maybe just stopped the ministry that day. Hey, let's just pack everything up. Let's get out of here. And we ministered to so many people that day and were able to do that. And the very thing that diffused that very thing was that, was that smile. And so I would say that that man's life, listen to this, he wasn't a Bible scholar, he wasn't a pastor, he wasn't, I mean, if you would look at him, I mean, look at what I was doing. But his life in that moment gave life. It didn't drain that man. But that man who was beside himself because of, you know, his sin was draining life. And what is better? The Bible says it's better to give, right, than to receive. So make sure that your life live for the Lord. And I use the story because it always reminds me how the Lord provides the most craziest things to help in some of the most craziest times. But ultimately here, the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. And then it says this, to turn one away from the snares of death. Isn't that what was happening in that situation? It's like, you know, we could, have, we could have utterly destroyed what God was trying to do in that man's life. Utterly destroyed. But here it says, the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life, then to turn one away from the snares of death. Wisdom also does that too. It preserves us. It reminds us of what it is to, to walk away from those things that, that could bring death and or death to our walk as well. That's another point too, spiritually speaking. In a multitude of people is a king's honor, but in the lack of of people is the downfall of a prince. In other words, numbers to a king are very important. And if there's no people to lead, then the king really has nothing to do. But the Bible says that numbers um, really have little significance. They have little significance with the Lord's presence. Um, what we see here is that some put their confidence in things. And, and this is the folly of man. This is the downfall to man that that their hope perhaps is, well, I got this. If I don't have this, then I don't have nothing. Or if I have this, I have everything. He who is slow to wrath has great understanding, but he who is impulsive exalts folly. He who is slow to wrath has great understanding. You know, we all can use a, well, maybe not all of us, but some of us here tonight, if you want to be honest, can use a little bit of work on slowing your wrath a bit. Anybody here have an issue with anger? Just curious. Anybody else want to not lie and say you do? Yeah, it's good. <laughs> Second go around is always good. It seems like more hands go up. No. <laughs> but, but listen to what he's saying here. It says, he who is slow to wrath has great understanding. You know, it's hard sometimes to not say something like just, right? But, you know, sometimes the Lord helps you with that. All of a sudden, there's something you want to say, but for whatever reason, you know, I say it's the Lord. Some people say, well, I was going to say this, but I got distracted by 
what you said and I forgot what I was going to say. I believe for the believer, that's the Lord's work in you. And then you think about what you would have said. And then you're like, man, I'm so glad I didn't say that. That's the work of the spirit in the life of the Christian. That is this picture here of a person who is slow to wrath has great understanding. Listen to this. When a person is wrathful, when a person, like the Bible says, you know, uh, a fool vents out all his feelings, right? You'll never have understanding. You got to sometimes just stop, assess the situation, and then kind of go back to the verse here. If what I'm about to say, all of us will at some point be in this situation, and some of you will be in there maybe today, tonight, who knows? But Ask yourself, if what I'm going to say, is it going to be life-giving or life-draining? Am I going to tear a person down? And there's really no excuse for that. As some people say, well, I, I didn't mean to say that I can take back. You can't take back your words. They've already been said. Now, a person can choose to forgive you, and God bless it, but the greater thing in all of it is that we learn to be slow to wrath. But he who is impulsive, listen to this, who is short of spirit. Now, this is kind of going back to what we started talking about, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. In other words, a person who is short of spirit, a person who is impulsive, exalts folly. In other words, they disregard that. We have to be careful not to be short of spirit. Galatians 5 says, this is what it is to walk in the fruit of the spirit. And, and listen to this, wrath is not part of it. There's love, joy, peace. There's nothing wrathful about that. Here's the one though. Here's the one that wrath wrestles with, two of them for that matter, and it's patience and kindness. How many of you here tonight need patience? I, I, I like this whole, you know, honesty session tonight. <laughs> but <laughs> the word here for patience in Galatians 5 literally means a remaining under. A remaining under when one bears up under a burden. That's the picture here. And this steadfastness that one can have in difficult times or difficult circumstances. This whole picture here is for a person to have patience and do so in such a way that gives them long temper and or, you know, long suffering. It's something that we desire to have. It's something that we need. But this whole picture of being patience or long suffering is the sense of the ability to hold one's temper for a long period of time. You know, the Bible talks about controlling your temper. You can in the spirit. You can do so as you allow the spirit to lead you. Now, um, we talked, I think, last week or one of the other Sunday nights on this topic. But that is, you know, ever meeting an angry person. You, you just, anybody know an angry person? Don't look around, but just have you, you know, somebody who's angry? Good, okay. Yeah, it's funny, because every time we ask these things, people look at each other, next to each other, like, it's like, I know what your issue is now. You know, it's like, they just hold on you by looking at the person next to you. <laughs> I, I've learned my lesson with that, too. I only say that as a joke, because one time I, I was saying something, and, you know, with, with the church, so many people come in and come out, so many visitors, and we don't know everybody, but there was a guy and a gal sitting next to each other. I don't know why everybody sits so close in this church next to each other. It, it's fine it's, if you're related, but if you're not related, you know, I, I don't know if you are, because the way you're sitting by each other, I would assume that there's some relation. So I assume this couple was together. Maybe not married, I didn't know, but I'm talking, and why? The lady kept staring at the guy, I thought, oh, this dude's jacked. <laughs> but he never looked at her. I'm like, oh, he's mad at her. <laughs> oh, man, they probably got into it. This is a good message for them, right? And I'm, bah, 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 bah. I'm like, oh, Lord, the spirit's at work. Everything, service is over. The lady just gets up and walks out. Boom, boom, boom. And I'm just like, oh, this dude is, oh, man. 
he one of those kind of guys. So, you know, I go up to him like, howdy, pilgrim. You know what I mean? Like, hey, I'm going to get with this guy. And I says, hey, man, how you doing? He's like, oh, man, it's my first time here. And I said, well, how did you hear about us? He's like, oh, I just, you know, I just came by myself. The whole time I was narrowed in on him, you know, and you got to repent, you know, kind of. <laughs> and I was like, really? Like, nobody brought you, a friend, a sister, nobody? He's like, no, first time I heard about it. It's like, wow. <laughs> to this day, I don't know why the lady was staring at him. Maybe because he was sitting too close to her. I don't know. But not once did he look at her. I thought, oh, he's stone cold. Like, that's a man's man right there. He's in church, in church. He's a bad dude, man. Poor guy. He didn't even know anybody here. He didn't even know what was going on. Anyways. <laughs> and then he says, I just like the way you just like, you preach hard, man. I was like, yeah, that sermon was for you. But anyways, <laughs> never came back, never seen him again. <laughs> so... Anyways, <laughs> so he goes on to say here, he who is slow to wrath has great understanding, but he who is impulsive exalts folly. Walk in the spirit. Don't be short of spirit. Listen to this. If we have these issues, if we have anger issues, if, or listen to this. If you make decisions in haste, making hasty decisions, a child of God, their decisions are not their own to make on their own. Their decisions are to be weighed in the word of God, made through the word of God with the Lord's help. There's safety in that, big time. So do that. A sound heart is life to the body. Kind of like the same thing here. The fear of the Lord is the fountain of life. Listen to this. A sound heart is life to the body, but envy is rottenness to the bone. What's in your heart today? What, what is there? What is taking residence in your heart? You know, in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 34 and also in Luke chapter 6 and verse 45, we know the passage that says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak, right? And the, the picture there is Jesus is saying, ultimately, what's in your heart, it'll be identified. He talks about identifying what a person really is all about. And if there is constant evil and wickedness and idolatries and all these things coming out, Jesus says that most likely that's what's in a man's heart. And if there is good, not saying that you're always going to be nailing it right on, but ultimately if there is, you know, a consistency of good and good deeds and, and good actions and good works in your life, then ultimately that's what's in your heart. But there are times when a person can outwardly deceive. It's called hypocrisy. It doesn't last long, it's short-lived, because ultimately your heart will expose you. But the whole picture is here, is a sound heart is life to the body. And let's think about things like depression and stresses and these types of things like this. They affect our bodies physically. Because our bodies were not created to bear these things. These things are a result of the fall. And we live in a time in which so many people, rather than do a heart check, they try to, and I mean spiritually, they try to do a physical check before they do a spiritual check. I would say flip that around, do a spiritual check first. And I would say that it's safe to say to some degree, the physical will fix itself. Because when a person's heart is sound, there's no stresses or worry. Healthy mind and healthy body, so to speak. But envy is rottenness to the bones. If there is envy in the heart, unforgiveness and bitterness. You ever met a bitter person? Their face stays that way. I'm, I'm being honest, not trying to be funny. They do. And they grow older quicker. Serious. They're bitter. We always say, we look at someone like, oh, you lived a rough life. You could tell. Because that's what life does. But also these things do as well. Envy is rottenness to the bones. He who oppresses the poor, listen to this, reproaches his maker. It's kind of what we were talking about last week on the topic of, you know, 
but he who has mercy, verse 21, on the poor is happy. Not only are they happy, listen to this, they honor their maker, but the one who oppresses the poor reproaches his maker, reproaches the Lord God. That's why Jesus said, if you've done this to the least of these, you've done it unto me. But he who honors him has mercy on the needy. That, that in a sense, also, too, as you can tell, if someone says, you know, well, I love God. Well, if you were to go to James and say, hey, I love God, James will say, okay, well, then show me your works. I mean, at some point, there has to be the evidences in your outworking that what you are saying outwardly is very consistent with what has taken place inwardly. And you don't really have to do much, but allow the Spirit to lead you. And if you walk according to the Spirit, well, Paul says you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. It doesn't say you're going to be sinless or perfect because we don't always nail it spiritually every time. Can I get a witness? But there's mercy and grace when we fail, when we fall short. But look at what he goes on to say here. The wicked is banished in his wickedness, but the righteous has a refuge in his death. This was like the hope of the Old Testament, that the righteous have refuge in death. This is what Job was talking about in Job chapter 19 in verses 25 through 26. Remember that, that great passage of scripture where Job just kind of lays out and he says, listen, I don't have the answers to everything, but here's what I do know. I love this. He says, here's what I do know. I know this. I know that my redeemer lives for I know my redeemer lives and he shall stand at last on the earth and after my skin is destroyed this I know that in my flesh I shall see God two things that he knew he says I don't understand why I'm going through what I'm going through why have I experienced the losses that I've experienced why the tragedy has hit me the way it did but here's what I do know I know that my redeemer lives and I know that I will see the Lord when I die This, this whole picture here of what death was in this context here. It was a refuge. Kind of like the life of the Christian. We know that the moment we give our last breath here will be our first breath in eternity. Wisdom rests in the heart of him who has understanding, but what is in the heart of fools is made known. Now remember, Wisdom given in a proper time, in proper use. In other words, it is quietly reserved for the right time. But what is in the heart of fools is made known. In other words, a fool just blurts out his or her folly. They just, they just get it out. As, as, as the scriptures say that we are to be, James says we are to be what? Quick to listen and slow to what? Slow to speak. Righteousness exalts a nation. In other words, it preserves a nation. It exalts a nation. But sin, in other words, the absence of righteousness is a reproach to any people. The absence of righteousness brings shame. And as we close tonight, verse 35 says, the king's favor is toward a wise servant. See, that word there, wise, is prudent. Let me help you guys with prudent people. Now, I, I know some prudent people. Before, you know, the Lord brought prudent people into my life, people that just very careful thinking everything through. And for somebody that's young, you know, it's kind of like, you know, are you, you, know, are you done thinking? Because I already know what I want to do. And oh, that, used to get, that used to get me. And I'll never forget, you know, a gentleman, you know, who still sits, you know, in ministry here in this church told me, he says, the reason why I take time when I make a decision is because I don't want to stand before the Lord and him say, I've entrusted you with this ministry. And you chose your wisdom over mine. And I thought to myself, well, yeah, I don't want to do that either. You know, I mean, that's very well said. 
you know, but then I started thinking about it. It says, am I choosing my wisdom over the Lord's? How will I know? The only way I'll know is if I begin to practice this, if I begin to use wisdom, not be so quick in making decisions. And then, you know, time went on. And then <laughs> years later, I was told by, <laughs> you know, an older man, the opposite. He says to me, you know what I've learned from you? I've learned how to wait on the Lord. He says, I, I, I was just going for it. And then all of a sudden it's like, he gets to Pastor David and it's like, it's gonna be there for a while. He takes his time on things. Well, I do. And I probably don't make things, you know, as exciting or as fun. Probably by the time it does happen, all the excitement's gone. <laughs> because we've waited so long. But ultimately, at the end of the day, I do want to make wise choices, wise decisions. I want to be a wise servant. I don't know about you guys, but I do. But his wrath is against him who causes shame. In other words, his wrath is against those who are not prudent, those who are not careful, those who are not thoughtful, those who are not wise. And so this whole picture, what is wisdom? Well, ultimately, we see that the majority of the chapter deals with how one lives his life. I would say the fear of the Lord, there is strong confidence. His children will have a place of refuge. The fear of the Lord is the fountain of life to turn one away from the snares of death. But the fear of the Lord is the blessedness of walking in the fruit of the Spirit and allowing that very thing to be what sets the course in your life. The Bible says in verse 16 of chapter 15, better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure with trouble. Let that verse be what catapults you into this next week if the Lord tarries. Say, Lord, I, I want to walk in the fear of the Lord. I want to be wise. I want to practice prudence. I want, I want to be prudent in things. I want to use wisdom in things. And so may we, we do that. Amen. Let's pray.